I am very pleased to adopt the protocol that came before me, but I hope nobody gets jealous if I give Mrs. Hills Mr. Manning a special good morning. We've known each other for a long time and I haven't seen her for a long time. So good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see such a mixed audience. As Professor Amber uh, explained, I wasn't quite sure who I was speaking to until late last night. But I entitled my presentation, Modern Pitfalls in Decision Making, because I think it applies to everyone, whether we are the ones making the decisions or whether we are the subjects of the decisions. I know it's not going to be a long law, law lecture, but what I really wanted to focus on was some sort of practical legal principles which would be useful in the employment context, in the company context. So whether you're a manager, whether you're an aspiring manager, I'm sure most of you are if you're not already, and indeed your obligations towards your co-workers. Some of them are quite traditional, um, though perhaps not so well known. Others, perhaps more exciting bits, are uh, the principles which are emerging, which really have to do with human rights principles, which should they form part of administrative decision making. And I think if we were to overcome some of these obstacles, and if we were to conduct our organizations um, in, 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 in light of these, then we will certainly move towards the excellence that is the theme of this um, conference. I always tell my students that law really is common sense. And we have a subject called administrative law, so it's really about administrative good common sense. Uh, so you're familiar with some things being reasonable in the decisions that take place at the workplace and in the organization. But today we talk more about fairness, a very elusive concept perhaps in many ways. But it's not at all it's not at all subjective. Some of things, what is reasonable? That is subjective. What is fair is subjective. Really is taken about just talking about taking relevant considerations into account and ignoring those that are irrelevant. You're also familiar with principles today like natural justice that has entered the mainstream of the workplace. You know, natural justice shouldn't be biased, we should have here. Yeah, that really is a fundamental human rights principle and administrative law uh, principle, again, which has be become mainstream. But there are other ones that perhaps sometimes we ignore. One of the ones that I have found going through all of the cases and listening to the case studies and the stories is how often we act outside of our jurisdiction. We call that excess jurisdiction in law. But from a practical point of view, we are all given a certain remit, a certain boundary in terms of our power. Uh, whether it's a government, whether it's an employer, whether it's a manager, whether it's someone who's just a supervisor, as the case may be, you always have to act within the four corners of the power that you've been given to. Otherwise, that becomes what we call ultra-virus. You could quash the decision that you have made. And the most colorful and perhaps the most famous example, which is a landmark case in law, it's one that had to do with TV licenses in the UK. And in the UK, surprise, surprise, you actually have to pay a license fee if you own a TV. I know that sounds really crazy, doesn't it? You know, we're talking about property taxes, but we pay for TVs. <laughs> they don't just they own the TV and to use the TV. And when this came into being many years ago, the minister announced it quite excitedly ahead of time. And he said, well, January 1st, from then you will start paying this fee every year. So of course, all the intelligent citizens rushed ahead and they paid it beforehand so that they, they, they signed up and so they wouldn't have to pay the new tax. And then the, the minister determined, okay, we'll make it retroactive. So he introduced the law to get back the, the monies. And the court said, no. Your purpose is not to increase the coffers of the, of, of the state. Your purpose is just to regulate TV licenses. So there's a profound principle there as to sticking within the boundaries of the discretion or the power that you actually have. It's a general principle. And it's also, I think, a principle that speaks to fairness in decision making. The other one I thought that I would mention today, because obviously we have many speakers, so I'm just giving you a little pointers. Uh, I don't know whether there, there's time for questions afterwards, so I haven't been told, but at least it, give you, it gives you a little teaser. So one of the others that I thought might be useful, and something again that we hear a lot about these days, is this notion of a legitimate expectation. I'm sure you've heard that. Everybody talks about, well, we have a legitimate expectation to this and to that. 
It's a term that's actually very much understood. Again, a legal principle that emerged from human rights and got itself into administrative law. And it really speaks to consistency at the enterprise, uh, whichever level that may be, that you must act with consistency. And part of consistency, of course, is fairness. I think in the context of policy, it's also very interesting because Acting consistently, does that mean, for example, that you can't change policy, whether it's the company, whether it's the government? If you say, well, I have a legitimate expectation that you would act in this way or a certain thing, it has some difficulties for change when you're trying to create change. So we've had a lot of argument as to what it really means. Is, it, is there a substantive right to a thing? Like, you know, everybody else in my position got that promotion. How come I'm in that same position, I did not get the promotion? So there may be a change in the policy that from now on, only um, men of tw between 20 and 30 will get that post, let's say. Uh, the, so the, the difficulty really there, very often we would not, the courts would not take into account what we call a substantive right, unless you've been promised something specifically but they have been very strict in terms of a persistent practice. And I remember years ago, before this principle had really become clear in law, my brother, I, I was out of Trinidad for 30 years, so I, I'm sort of a, almost like a tourist these days, but my brother called me up because the tax board, um, were, they were levying taxes on him, and he was saying, but you know, they haven't done it, they know, they've never done it before, how come? And of course, I helped him and wrote a very nice little letter about legitimate expectation and practice, and they settled with him. So it really means that you cannot, as a decision maker, as an enterprise, as a government, as the case may be, change policy midway without, listen to it, consultation or fair hearing. So it's not that you can't change it, but the fairness aspect comes into it. And that's another general principle I think is important, whichever level you're at. I see some um, school children here, so hopefully these ideas, would, as you grow, you would think about these ideas, which are really quite generous. So it's not that you want to frustrate it, but you must approach it with fairness. The other one I thought I would mention is maybe you haven't heard about this one, which is a principle of proportionality. Again, proportionality, a human rights principle. It's really very interesting how that has come into everyday administrative decision making and so on. And this one, I think the best way to describe it is that you cannot take a hammer to kill an ant. You know, so this idea that you, t you, 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 you may make a decision and generally it applies to punitive, one which has punitive consequences, but you must act in the way that is least invasive of someone else's rights and entitlements. So if there's a way that you can approach it without offending really deep issues and interests and entitlements, that's the way you could take. So again, um, to give another example from the European Court on Human Rights, uh, in France, since we are on the French um, today, <laughs> Professor, they wanted, the government wanted to ensure that persons pay their taxes, so they wanted information. So what they did was to allow persons to enter houses and buildings and so on and basically seize thousands of documents in order to be able to determine whether someone was liable. That was held to be disproportionate. So yes, you have a right. To the, um, to the tax, but how you go about it. And yes, this morning, or was it yesterday? It couldn't have been this morning because I got up at five o'clock and came here. So it had to be yesterday's, um, um, I'm sure. They were talking about, some people saying, oh, the new property tax, we don't mind paying it, but can somebody come to my property in order to, to, to determine? That might be something that the court might consider in terms of your rights of to security and privacy, not the actual tax itself. So I think proportionality, proportionality is one of those that we must always pay regard to when we make decisions or when we are the subject of, of, of decisions. And of course, I've been talking about decisions that are made, but very often, particularly in the, in the Caribbean, our problem is not making decisions. Our problem is not making decisions. Our problem is being afraid to make decisions. Don't you think so? We omit to make 
especially hard decisions. We are afraid of the consequences. And even there, that situation can run you afoul of the law because we have a fancy name for that. It's called abdication of discretion. So if you have been given the authority, if you have been given the power to make a decision, you can't either delegate it to someone else and ask someone else to do the dirty work or simply not do it, turn a blind eye. That is a, a very significant principle. And I think it speaks also to accountability in whether it's the enterprise, the business, the government, as the case may be. And getting in square to the human rights issues, because I've given you a few principles which touch on those areas. But today, all, um, all enterprises, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector, have to pay specific and direct regard to very clear human rights principles, in particular discrimination. We have an act, Equality of Opportunity. Some of you may have heard of it. We've only now started to litigate. Just last year, the tribunal was up. But not only in terms of the legislation, but many companies, very big businesses and companies know today that if you don't have an adequate human rights policy or anti-discrimination agenda in your workplace, you may not qualify to, to trade with certain partners overseas, et cetera. You would not qualify for aid. So it's a really big thing. Human rights is now a business principle. So under our act, we have the, 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 the basic principles that you would, uh, basic grounds of discrimination that you would think familiar, race, gender, et cetera. These are all there, but they don't exist in a vacuum. You have to have a culture of anti-discrimination. You have to have a culture of equality. In the, in the society generally, to really be able to treat with these issues. And one of the points that I like to make when I talk about this, and I've done training for the Equal Opportunities Commission and so on, apart from the fact that most people are totally unaware of their rights, you, us, we just don't know what your rights are, whether it's in housing, because the Act speaks to housing too, not just employment, but also do we understand some of the concepts, how broad these concepts are. So we all know that we should not discriminate against a person because of their race, let's say. We know that, so we're not going to say we don't want Chinese people working for us, as the case may be, or we're not going to give them a promotion. We know that. But the difficulty, the more subtle nuances of this law that we now have, and we are one of the few countries in the region that has this law, by the way. We weren't the first, but there were only a handful of us who have this specific kind of law. The more important principle is what I would call indirect discrimination or de facto inequality, meaning that you can act, the company, the government, the university can act in ways that seem, is a seemingly neutral. It doesn't seem to be affecting anybody or targeting anybody, and that's important because intention is irrelevant. You could not intend to be discriminating, but if it is that the impact of your decisions or your actions are discriminatory, that is also um, makes you liable in anti-discrimination law today. We call that indirect discrimination. We talk about structural patterns of discrimination. Uh, one of the famous cases, for example, a case called Bilka a few years ago, which is now standard, sounds a little off when you think about it at first. Um, the employer said, I'm only going to give pensions to people who are part-timers. So if you're a part-time employer, you're not entitled to a pension. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? You're a part-timer, why should you get a pension? But when they analyzed the situations in that industry, all of the part-timers were women. So it was an indirect discriminatory act. It didn't intend it, but the impact was discriminatory against women. A very famous um, case which has led to a huge development in law. So we have to look for these things. So I was reading just yesterday a very interesting article, some research done on microfinancing in the Caribbean in terms of when you try to give persons who need small loans, people in the informal sector, people who trade, you know, not any big firms. And there are very important patterns emerging. So if you live in the country, you're less susceptible, you're less um, likely to get a loan because of preconceived notions as to who can pay. And if you live in the country, it may well be that you have a certain race. You see where I'm going with this? So you have to be very careful. 
If, as you've been seeing in your newspaper, you say that I want people with neat hair, well, you start excluding a lot of people. Well, you might exclude me, first of all. But usually, you exclude people of a certain ethnic group. Isn't that so? So that might sound fine. You know, if you're working in a bank, you must have neat hair. You must speak a certain way. But that may be indirectly discriminatory. So we don't have time to go into all of it, but I want us to start thinking about these issues because all of us are part of that whole discussion. And uh, we all have a duty in our society not to blind ourselves to some of the impacts of either our actions or our omissions. And the last point that I wanted, oh, and before I move on to the last point, we also have a duty to make accommodation, the principle of accommodation. Just recently, the university introduced, strengthened its, its principles into the with disabilities, for instance. So it starts off with disability, but accommodation can be much broader than just disability. So it means that if there are structural patterns of inequality in our society, we have a duty to ensure that we can bring people on board. The disability thing is easy to concept, conceptualize because it means, for example, that you, know, you have to have physical workplace Maybe you have to give them more time to do a task, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's a general principle. And the last point that I wanted to leave with you, again, very important, very topical, and that has to do with the whole issue of sexual harassment. Again, we at UWE we've just had a new sexual um, harassment um, policy and procedure. I had planned to put it up on the screen and so on. But then um, Professor Mbe warned me that we have all of these wonderful dynamic speakers. So we're not going to bother with that. But I wanted to simply say to you that this, of course, is an aspect of gender discrimination. But part of the problem that I've observed in relation to sexual harassment, and it's all around us, even Bill Riley, is that his name? O'Reilly or Riley, whichever one he is. You know, we are now beginning to take it seriously. And we've had some very high profile ones recently in Trinidad and Tobago as well. Part of the difficulty is that we don't really understand what it means. Because we all think it's about what we call quid pro quo approach, meaning that I ask you for sex and you either say no. If you say no, then I victimize you. If you say yes, we're not even sure what that is. If you say yes, is that sexual harassment? <laughs> Actually, yes, that's all the question, because if you are put in a, in a, in a context of vulnerability, it's, it's about power relations. So that's one, even the quid pro quo, I always get it wrong. But the more important concept and the more common concept has to really do with what we call a hostile working environment. So it may have nothing to do with asking someone for a sexual favor. But if it is that you create a working environment which is based on sex and which can be hostile or intimidating to persons because of that, that can be sexual harassment. And yesterday I was asked, you know, the problem I have with this is that it seems as though you can't say anything these days. This is a gentleman saying that to me. I'm not going to tell you who the gentleman was. And that's a real concern. Because if it is that you know, you, we, are, we are accustomed giving little pecan to each other, a, a looking real sexy today, things like that. Um, we don't want to have a politically correct society where you're afraid to talk to each other. We don't want that. One of the few cases that we've had in Trinidad and Tobago Republic Bank actually talked about this, about our culture, pecan and so on. But there's a line to be drawn. So we get into the subjective and the objective. So if the person does feel disempowered, if we said, I don't like this, if the person doesn't feel that way, it's not. But if they do, it is indeed a hostile working environment. If you're plastering pictures of nude women in the workplace, you know, and we all have obligations towards each other, it's not just the employer. We tend to think that's about some, some supervisor and employer. No, it's not just about that. It's about you and I. In fact, all of the cases we've had in the Caribbean, we've had very few, have been co-workers are the ones who engaged in the sexual harassment. It's the co-workers. And sometimes, to go back to the omissions, it's because the supervisors have failed to act when things are reported, very common, which is, again, makes you liable in sexual harassment law, by the way. But really, it's about identifying us, understanding as a society, what 
sexual harassment really means. So if you're making offensive remarks and the, society, the um, place is geared towards, you know, everything is, uh, and it could also be about race, by the way, um, race harassment and so on, that can ground your offense. So it's no longer about quid quo pro, we have a much more sophisticated understanding of it. And we really now is the time, I think, and we have, I invite you to go on our website and read our sexual harassment policy and the procedures and the sensitivities. We're doing the training now, that's the UE that is, trying to lead in this process for us to have a better understanding. But at the end of the day, I think what I want to leave with you is that there are some key principles which are of general application. If you want a successful and excellent work environment, professional environment, these are some of the key principles, many of them coming from the human rights concerns and awareness, which the whole world is gearing towards, that I would invite you to consider. Thank you very much.